Behavioral economics um, describes um, the way people behave in ways that are not consistent with the standard textbook economic model. The standard model assumes that consumers make choices to maximize their utility and firms make choices to maximize profits. But in real life, uh, as common sense and common observation will tell you, people don't always behave in those rational ways and as a matter of fact, neither do firms. One of the reasons that we wrote this book was we felt it would be important to compare the standard models of choice, expected utility theory, and ex maximizing expected profits that Mark mentioned with the way uh, individuals and insurers actually behave. And so we, at, we looked at these models as benchmark models and found that in many situations uh, they behave quite rationally from that vantage point, but in other situations they actually behave very differently. And so by understanding that a bit better, we felt we could then suggest ways to improve not only their behavior, individuals and firms, but help society and its well-being in the process. Most of the time, actually, or at least a very large part of the time, people do behave rationally when it comes to insurance, and so do firms. So people buy auto collision coverage on their new car, and then they drop it when the car becomes a junker. Uh, they typically don't buy rental insurance unless they're storing a lot of jewels in the, in the, in the rental apartment. But if it's, if it's graduate school furniture, there's not much point in buying rental insurance. Uh, but uh, there are some important exceptions, which we think can generally be characterized as low probability, high consequence events where people do make mistakes or more generally where the uh, combination of risk and the circumstances makes it hard for people to easily figure out what's the sensible thing to do. The insurance industry uh, um, is supposed to be maximizing expected profits, which means that it should be willing to continue to offer insurance uh, even when it's risky to do so. But what uh, seems to happen is that when there, particularly when there have been catastrophic events, they react by becoming much more risk averse by either refusing to sell coverage or by dramatically increasing premiums much more dramatically than would be suggested by the actual change in the uh, expected chance of loss. So I think the main behavioral issue that uh, at which the Affordable Era Care Act was directed was the phenomenon of the young immortals, of people who were young or high or low risk, uh, not necessarily young, who hadn't been sick for a long time and felt that um, it, it wasn't going to happen to them. And so they didn't need insurance, of course, until they got sick, but you can't sell insurance on that basis. And so uh, the mandate um, in the uh, ACA and also the subsidies to encourage people to buy insurance were in part in intended to offset that kind of irrational behavior. On the other hand, some other features of the ACA are probably counterproductive. In particular, uh, the same young people are going to be charged premiums which are higher relative to their uh, expected claims than had been the case in order to provide uh, lower premiums for higher risk older people. But the consequence will be that those younger people, when they are rational, and sometimes they are, would realize that this is actually not a very good financial deal. And because the penalties uh, in, in the uh, individual mandate are relatively mild, uh, they may choose uh, to go without insurance because of this change. In 2012, in July, the Bigot Waters Act was passed that uh, really indicated that in order for to us to retire the old debts from the flood insurance program, there were very large losses after Hurricane Katrina, one should set premiums reflecting risk for all of those who were living in the area, gradually doing that, but recognizing that affordability was a key issue, another principle in our book. Our hope is that with this book, we can make the case that it is important important to have premiums reflecting risk to encourage individuals to reduce their losses so that they get a premium reduction, something that would not be true if it turns out premiums were highly subsidized, and to let people know how hazardous the area is in much the same way that with health insurance people should know what their health risk is and premiums are a good signal for doing that. 
Mark and I had a good time playing our two different roles as we wrote this book. Uh, as Mark indicated, um, individuals uh, often and firms are often quite rational, and I was seeing the other side of that, that they basically were behaving in ways that didn't seem to uh, really encourage the kind of, of, of uh, decisions that we hoped would be made. And as a result, we constantly found ourselves having that kind of dialectic or dialogue by saying we have our benchmark models of expected utility and profit maximization. When do we actually follow these models? And when are there pro challenges with actually dealing with them? And in, in, the, in the process, we felt that we could su uh, suggest a set of principles and guidelines for insurance in terms of what it should do as well as for consumers in terms of how they should behave.